G'day, I'm John o. Freeman. This is Eating Bacon. May golden Apollo supply me with cups full of water from the Castalian Spring. Though it may not have been so in the author's time, today's culture is very interested in knowing about our great artists and their private stories, so we can better understand them and how they arrived at their works. While Shakespeare is certainly revered with a powerful vacuum in his life history, we can never feel close or connected to this figure. With Bacon comes the opportunity for something different, who turns out owns a story of Shakespearean magnitude, carrying with it a sense of injustice, misunderstanding and personal sacrifice. Here, we will use the archetypal tragic protagonist from the play Timon of Athens as a vehicle for exploring the tragic personal life story of its primary author, Sir Francis Bacon. The creation of this text requires a process, learning, genius, but also a strong emotional understanding of events. With just one example among many, we may link the crucial life experience required of such a creative rendering in tandem with Bacon's history. Shakespeare is alchemic. It can put us in touch with the divine within us through love and the lessons each of us extract in our own way from the stories selected, adapted and created. In Timon, so raw, highly emotional and empathetic, we may find catharsis for the author and audience alike. A powerful tool for the poet to work through his tragedies, sharing them with us for our benefit and growth. In doing so, Bacon's vulnerability is offered up to us, his humanity exposed. As with the sonnets, plays are not just demonstrations of technical and disconnected craft. The process is enmeshed with personal emotion. In ancient Greek theatre, we are all devoured by Mother Earth. This made me think of how in Shakespeare, the divine moves from the universe inside of us so that we eat each other. How true this is of Timon, a play overly peppered in eating metaphors, also found in The Merchant of Venice. And this is where our title, Eating Bacon, comes from. Eating Bacon? Just as how, with a wink, Bacon used the pound of flesh to metaphorically conjure consumption and the forbidden through the taboo Jew. It relates to winning the bounty and eating the meat of others. But in the case of Timon, through flattery rather than honest dealing and friendship. Both Timon and Bacon are the very soul of bounty, and yet we witness an unraveling of tragic destiny. I am Tregos, the good god of theatre! Traditionally, we are presented with the goat soul, Tregos, embodied in the tragic protagonist, their curse, their sacrifice. This is Capricorn, but I like the image of this divine spirit plus I'm a cat. We can think of tragedy as having a trajectory. Modern poetics is essentially based on the work of Aristotle. The history of modern poetics is the history of its reception and influence. In a single seminal sentence, the poetics informs readers that a tragedy accomplishes through pity and fear the catharsis of such emotions. We have then an indication of the emotional connection made possible through performance. James Joyce says pity will unite us with the suffering victim and fear will unite us with the secret cause of the victim's suffering. Aristotle tells us that what may be painful in real life afforded an accurate portrayal in poetry allows us an appropriate pleasure. Ford argues it is not possible to settle on a singular meaning for catharsis. He shifts the focus onto Aristotle's ancient problem if this poetics is to have a definable subject, the nature of catharsis must remain largely outside of the account. Ford favours a kind of pleasing and relaxing emotional experience which supervenes on certain stimuli. Sachs tells us that identification is key for the modern tragic audience. Minor shifts in traditional plots may have a major theatrical gain which can touch a modern audience to the emotional quick. Abel believes that what is required of a proper emotional engagement with Greek tragedy is the operation of what he calls implacable values, and it is such values that modern feeling tells us are false. 
His alternative for the modern tragic is the world of meta-theatre, a world of imagination in which life is already theatricalized, unlike the real world we find in tragedy. Shakespeare has been cited as an example of a great dramatist who turned tragic situations into meta-plays in which the comic and the tragic are brought together under a single unified form. Irony, common to tragedy and comedy, as Somdi informs us, is heightened in Tragic Modern when it is taken out of the universe and theatrically injected into the characters themselves or the society. There is only supposition as to how Stratford Mann became so acquainted and concerned with such principles. For Bacon, it's a no-brainer. Considering his known interest in drama and poesy, his absolute silence about the first folio is so strange as to be significant. He did, however, say, Tragedies and comedies are made up of one alphabet. In Shakespeare, moving so swiftly like quicksilver between the laugh and the drama, intense emotion can easily flip, as it does in Timon. Bacon taught man how to experiment for the good of humanity. The world has yet to learn that, apart from his known labours, his life was largely devoted to his concealed duties, the laying of secret bases for eternity, educational and ethical. It is said a curse not deserved will never come. Some may find it true, but to me a causeless curse did surely come and my entire life felt the blight. Bacon's tragedy has two parts. First is the story of his concealed identity as a Tudor prince, which is yet to be fully acknowledged. His existence was one big secret matter of state and so he lived a veiled and mysterious life, facing danger as a result of the political intrigues of the Queen's Secretary of State, Robert Cecil, and later Judge Edward Coke. He was continually next the door for advancement because of his birth and the precarious position of royal bastard. Also, his genius was off scale. We still can't see all the way round it. It's too big. He was cursed his entire life to battle ignorance through a mask. Throughout his painful journey, Bacon wrote poetry and plays under various pseudonyms, including William Shakespeare, to make right as he describes the true history of the times. He learned early to laugh at trouble and to turn the edge of disaster with a quibble and a smile, preserving his sanity in the dark storms which broke upon him. The second feeds into the first in that he was politically assassinated and banished at the height of his career in office as a scapegoat for the corrupt king and his favourite. An expendable sacrifice implicating the people over the rampant corruption in the upper echelons of power. In a letter of the time, Bacon speaks of King James thinking it good to make an oblation of my most humble service to his majesty. An oblation is an act of offering a sacrifice, in this case, his Tudor birthright. He also asked friend John Davies to defend him from slanders. Mr Davies, I mean to show you that I am not asleep. Briefly, I commend myself to your love and to the well-using of my name, as well in repressing and answering for me if there be any biting or nibbling at it in that place. It's his name that's at stake, his Tudor birth. Any nibbling at bacon... Nibbling bacon! <laughs> a fabulous covert jest would entrap him. Signing off with... So desiring you to be good to concealed poets. Bacon lets posterity know that he is a poet and a concealed one, while reminding Davies that just as he is content to lie concealed by the name of Shakespeare, so he is equally content to appear before the eyes of the world under the adopted name of Bacon. We can find tangible, genuine remains of Bacon within an array of texts, his musical poetry of trope, metaphor and symbol, with a variety of characters acting as his mouthpieces. There are striking similarities in parts like Timon. We find Bacon instructing us as he works through the damage caused by his rivals the jealousy and betrayal of those closest to him. In the fool's description of a spirit, sometimes appearing like a lord, a lawyer, a philosopher, and a knight. 
spake and calls to us. Come, shall we in and taste Lord Timon's bounty? He outgoes the very heart of kindness. In the play, we find Timon's ruin is due to an excess of generosity and a fatal inability to appreciate the value of money. His hand and purse were always ready to help his friends and servants. The consequence was that, apparently falling at last into dire financial straits and seeking in vain to supply his wants from those he had befriended, his journey moves away from love. I am misanthropos and hate mankind. The only Shakespeare play of which we can trace no hint of its existence prior to its publication in the first folio is Timon. Sir Sidney Lee suggested that the third and fifth acts of Timon were the work of a collaborator. <gasps> the Shakespearean unity is less of a problem for Baconians. Ah. Firstly, because the possibility of a group led by Sir Francis Bacon is admitted. Secondly, because we believe in a process whereby an author in the maturity of his genius may be expected to revise the productions of his youth. This, we believe, was Shakespeare's way, as it was certainly Bacon's way. As with tragedy, we may chart a trajectory in Shakespeare of a mighty mind and the working out of a lifelong altruistic purpose to procure the good of all men. Looking at the timeline, we can see Marlowe died in 1593, Oxford in 1604, and Shakespeare in 1616. The 1623 folio contained 17 plays which had been printed before, but were either rewritten, extensively revised, or subjected to verbal alterations of the most fastidious kind, revealing the author's hand on almost every page, including some of the finest passages in Shakespeare. It also introduced 19 plays published for the first time, such as Timon and Tempest, which seem to have been withheld from publication, saved by the author for his grand finale. It follows the author must have been alive in 1623. This gradual and methodical evolution and perfection of the Shakespearean text continued while Bacon was still living and when the others were dead. <coughs> Timon may never have been produced because it focused on too controversial a topic for the years directly after James's accession to the English throne. It contains a particularly sharp criticism of money management in his England, of extravagant generosity and careless expense when nobles' holdings were increasingly unable to support their spending. James himself was known for his enormous debt accrued in the process of providing his friends with expensive gifts. The play draws attention to the irresponsible behaviour of the upper classes and FYI, this presence of aristocracy again aligns with Bacon and belies Shacks. Ulrichi, referring to this play, writes that no one could have painted misanthropy with such truth and force without having experienced its bitter agony. Yet Sir Sidney Lee writes that Shakespeare's career shows an unbroken progress of prosperity and there is no support for the suggestion of a prolonged personal experience of tragic suffering. The experiences of Francis Bacon after his fall from power are precisely similar to those of Timon in this play. He suffered from the ingratitude of a great number of his so-called friends who deserted him. It must be remembered that Bacon fell from power in 1621 and the play of Timon is first heard of two years afterwards. Though Timon became a misanthrope, Francis Bacon retained his sweet disposition to the last. Connections. At the opening of the play, Timon says, Honest Ventidius, you mistake my love. I gave it freely, ever. And there's none can truly say he gives if he receives. Bacon similarly professed. I have chosen to sacrifice my own ease that humanity may reap many benefits from the many and diverse labours of my life. The life of Christ does show us what all life might be in unselfish ministry to the world's needs. As the scriptures say, freely you have received, so in like manner 
you must give. Alfred Dodd tells us Bacon was animated with the spirit of philanthropia. Enough for me the reward of well-doing. My mind turns on other wheels than those of profit. In this spirit, he founded his secret societies to carry on his work. He rang the bell to call the sciences together. He was not simply writing and talking. He was working and acting and establishing organized movements. This was Francis Bacon's kingdom, the unseen province of the mind. As a boy of 14, he had declared that his aim in life was to bring about the reformation of the whole wide world, an ideal which he wrote in his old age, he had never lost sight of in vicissitude and felicity. At his height, Bacon was rich, materially, mentally, and spiritually beyond the dreams of avarice. Timon is never more genuine than when expressing his views on friendship. <clears throat> O oh, you gods, think I, what need we have any friends if we should ne'er have need of them? They were the most needless creatures living, should we ne'er have use for them, and would most resemble sweet instruments hung up in cases that keep their sounds to themselves. I have often wished myself poorer, that I may come nearer to you, we are born to do benefits, and what better or properer can we call our own than the riches of our friends? As with Merchant, Timon concerns itself with the connection between ties of affection and monetary bonds. Always in Shakespeare, we find ambiguity and questioning. There is no judgment on the characters in Timon, but no one is without blame. The hero is too secure in his belief that he is wealthy in his friends. And we hear Bacon's voice in these characters as warnings about the flattery of those around us in being able to discern the truth from the lie. The character of Appomantus acts as a seer in this regard. He is the ironist in the guise of the fool. <laughs> Prithee, let my meat make thee silent. <laughs> I scorn thy meat to choke me, for I should ne'er flatter thee. Oh, you gods, what a number of men eat time on, and he sees them not. It grieves me to see so many dip their meat in one man's blood. He refuses Timon's generosity, saying, Thou givest so long time on. I fear me thou wilt give thyself away in paper shortly. Concerning extravagance, both Francis and his brother Anthony were labelled in posterity as spending squanderers. There is, however, no evidence they spent unwisely or on selfish pursuits but for the printing and publishing of anonymous books, the founding of a secret ethical society and the establishing of a state secret service, none of which were paid. Extravagant, yes, for a great educational cause. Bacon thought, Money is like manure. It is only good if you spread it around. And that the world needed these books and plays. And yet, society being what it is, there are those who would take advantage of good-natured generosity. The scene in the play violently turns from Timon's height to the reckoning fated him. I do fear, when every feather sticks in his own wing, Lord Timon will be left a naked gull, which flashes now a phoenix. Timon is soon devoured by the beasts of Athens. He ignores Apomantus, and when the loyalty and friendship of those he held dear is brought to attention, he is betrayed. Oh, that our ears should be closed to counsel. Death, but not to flattery. As with Merchant, creditors plague the protagonist. My lord, here's my bill. Here's mine. And mine, my lord. Knock me down with him. Cleave me to the girdle. Alas, my lord. Cut my heart in sums. 
My 50 talents. Tell out my blood. 5,000 crowns, my lord. 5,000 drops pays that. Tear me, take me, and the gods fall upon you. They have in put my breath from me to slaves, creditors, devils. The tragic web also allows us to feel layers of pity and fear through peripheral characters such as Flavius of the seemingly destructive impulses of the hero in which we are both fascinated and repulsed. He counsels Timon. The world is but a word. This also reflects Bacon's own attitudes on glory. The rising unto great place is laborious and the standing slippery. Great Timon, noble, worthy, royal Timon. When the means are gone, that by this praise the breath is gone, whereof this praise is made. Here, the flattery unapologetically exposes itself in the cold, faithless and shallow reactions of Timon's friends to his plight. There is a turning of backs, denied by all his friends are dead. Men shut their doors against a setting sun. The knowledge and horror of this is only truly borne by Timon's faithful servants. Ah, the fierce wretchedness that glory brings us. Who would not wish to be from wealth exempt, since riches point to misery and contempt? Who would be so mocked with glory, or to live but in a dream of friendship? To have his pomp and all what stake compounds, but only painted like his varnished friends. Poor honest Lord, brought low by his own heart, undone by goodness. Bounty that makes gods does still mar men. My dearest Lord, blessed to be most accursed. Rich only to be wretched, thy great fortunes are made thy chief afflictions. Alas, kind Lord, he's flung in a rage from this ingrateful seat of monstrous friends. There's something of Ben Johnson in Flavius, as this one honest man was a true friend to Bacon, who forsook him not. Bacon was arrested himself for debt at one time, having been left nothing by his foster father and often cut off from the royal purse that sustained him at the Queen's pleasure. He and Anthony were constantly selling estates and borrowing money in order to finance their underground English Renaissance. Bacon's essay of riches poetically mused in prose on his philosophy regarding the sweet king killer in which the noblest minds may be brought to basest ends. <laughs> this yellow slave will knit and break religions. Is it a coincidence that Francis Bacon, considered one of the most prodigal men that ever lived, was entirely indifferent to money? which he kept in an open chest from which he allowed his servants to help themselves, and that upon his downfall all his parasites forsook him. Here Bacon may rail as time on. Piety and fear, religion to the gods, peace, justice, truth, domestic awe, night rest and neighbourhood, instruction, manners, Mysteries and trades, degrees, observances, customs and laws. Decline to your confounding contraries and let confusion live. And grant, as time on grows, his hate may grow to the whole race of mankind, high and low. Amen. Time on reaches his salvation as a warrior 
a martyr against flattery. Oedipus Rex draws great life from both the tragic dialectic and the tragic hero's fundamental experience, the fact that salvation becomes annihilation. Here in Timon, we can also find a taste of this. Miraculously, in earthly exile, he finds more gold digging at the side of his grave. Fearing for their safety, the commons with one consent of love entreat me back to the city who have thought on special dignities which vacant lie for thy best use and wearing. Timon is offered a return, the restoration of his good name and the captainship. Ironically, no such offer was ever made to Bacon. Promising is the very heir of the time. Bacon was the king's servant to obey his command and sacrifice himself if necessary to save his master or the Commonwealth. It was Bacon's staunch observance to these beliefs that so greatly contributed to his ultimate ruin. Bacon never had a trial. He deserted his defence for the charge of bribery at the King's entreaty and relied on a royal promise of pardon. This to save the notoriously corrupt court from a direct collision with the Commons. To his sovereign, he says, I wish that as I am the first, so I may be the last of sacrifices in your times. Sonnet 125 written around the time of his fall, says, and take thou my oblation, poor but free. A repetition of his plea in another letter to King James. He was promised his name would be cleared along with his re-entry into court. This never came, and Bacon retired to Gorenberry, apparently dying alone in poor means. He did, however, create a body of work in his final years with a reach far greater than monuments and tombs. Neither time nor death can take my second kingdom from me. Timon hath made his everlasting mansion upon the beached verge of the salt flood, who once a day with his embossed froth the turbulent surge shall cover. Thither, come, and let my gravestone be your oracle. It seems both our figures are cast out to die, digging their own grave. Francis and Timon do divert here, however, as Bacon becomes Prospero, forgiving, accepting the light and dark in humanity, asking our indulgence to set him free, with equal tragic beauty, though more affirmation. The truth is buried as Timon carves his tombstone and Prospero drowns his book. Now let's address the issue of cipher. It is not easy to reveal secrets and at the same time create a wall to guard them. Bacon left a record in cipher, skillfully decoded by Mrs. Gallup, someone clever and patient enough for the job. In the late 1800s, Gallup and her colleague, Dr. Orville Ward Owen, discovered a secret coded diary of our genius embedded within the best of English Renaissance literature. The autobiography reveals startling facts about Sir Francis's life. It's a grave mistake to reject ciphers on a priori grounds and to declare they have no research value, factual or literary. Codes and ciphers have always played an important part in state affairs. They enter today into our business life, and in war, the cipher plays an all-important part. On the last page of the play, Bacon saw an opportunity to embed a cipher of his name in Timon's epitaph. Here lies a wretched course of wretched soul bereft. Seek not my name. But then comes the absurd. Here lie I, Timon, who alive, all living men did hate. Pass by and curse thy fill, but pass and stay not here thy gate. The epitaph identifies a difference between those who take in appearances as truth versus those that can see deeper into something's hidden nature, much like the Trinity Church Monument. 
The unsuspicious will quickly judge this to be a mistake, but Cypher demands we pause at absurdity and see the possibility of something not apparent. Examining the most likely hiding place, here lie I, Timon, we find that the name Timon has a count of 67 in simple cipher, the same as Francis. The monument in St. Michael's Church too proclaims a mystery. Sic sedebat runs the inscription, not the usual hic yaket. He sits as he used to sit, chin in hand, gazing into some new Atlantis of the future. Let compounds be dissolved, it reads, echoing, leaving not even a wisp of cloud behind, from Tempest. In 1741, Alexander Pope, the poet, and others designed this monument for Westminster Abbey. The passage from the Tempest has been altered and several spelling changes made. T.D. Bokenham squared the epitaph, finding two names, Francis Bacon, in the shape of an arch. Bokenham suggested that Pope had received secret information about the Baconian tradition and, for the sake of posterity, encoded the information in the cryptic manner hallowed by the tradition. The outline arch of the monument matches the arch formed by the cipher. The Shakespeare plays were not an end in themselves. They were an educational base for posterity on which to build, a bringing down to earth of the harp of the muses for others to play who had more skillful fingers. Truth is so hard to tell, it can sometimes need fiction to make it plausible. For that reason, the ancients carefully watched the action of the theatre, that it may improve mankind in virtue. For Bacon, theatre was a means of enlightenment, a good way of reaching the whole man, the emotions, as well as reason, and was to be the promised fourth part of his great instauration. On the title page of De Augmentis, 1645, the Dutch artist alludes to a restoration of the mysteries. The ancient dramatic method of teaching had been reintroduced by Bacon as a parallel to the direct teachings of history and science. While pointing to the open text, he calls us secretly to the Athenian hill through the medium of the tragic muse. At his foot is the symbol of the jester, Arts and sciences, like tragedies and comedies, are made up of one alphabet. Hey! It's your friend, Dragos, the god god of theatre. Just to remind you, it was the Greeks. <laughs>